Can we do one brag? Mm -hmm. Nick earned two points towards his rally intermediate title Saturday and Sunday, one point each day. Nice. So he's, he only needs three to get the title. So he's two thirds of the way there. Congratulations. A lot of hard work. Had, he's only had two attempts Saturday and Sunday to do right. that. Nick, what do you have? Oh, it's your ice cube. Okay. Never mind. <laughs> All right, noises. it is three after, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we may have a few more people joining. I know Ashlyn said she was going to be late, and speaking of that, I got to open the chat. And um, there it, is. it sounded like Lyra was planning on coming. Yes, I thought so as well. So, all right. So welcome everybody, um, we are off to a good start. So I'm going to actually copy and paste the questions in the chat group so that you can see them if you want them as well. And then we'll also kind of go through them. So for tonight's trainer talk, we're gonna be talking about calm behaviors. And I know that for this particular thing, there's a lot of different words and pretty much no two trainers train it or use the exact same methods to train it, use the exact same keywords. So to begin with, I kind of want to just see who we have in the group and how you use it kind of thing. So you can introduce yourself and your dog if you want to. Um, we know most of you. So uh, for those of you that haven't met me yet, I'm Penny from You for Paws of Love. And my service dog is the one in the picture on my screen, Azul. And he is definitely in bed. <laughs> so we'll kind of go around the room. Um, first of all, for settle or my calming behaviors, I use settle when I'm teaching a puppy. But ideally, once I teach the behaviors I want, I tend to phase out those cues. So in the early stages, I use a settle cue, I use a blanket or a place cue, and I may use a stay cue. But pretty much now environmental predicts it if I need Azul to be in a relaxed position, like under a table, he knows he's just going to lay down. If I'm sitting in a chair in an office, he knows he's going to lay down in whatever position I point to when I sit down, whether that's under my chair or whether that's tucked in a corner or whatever. So I don't use any cues anymore, but I kind of start with settle. There is one more that I still use on cue, and that's more of if the environment's not predicting it, I use the cue relax. And that's more like when we're out on a walk and we see another dog or there's something else going on where he's just more hyper. So I don't necessarily need him to lay down and hold a down stay or get comfortable in a certain position or anything. I just need him to bring his energy level down. And so that's kind of a calm behavior, but it's more of an extreme. It's not a specific, but just calm down. <laughs> so I do switch. still use that one. Yeah, it's a dimmer switch. That's a really good way to phrase it. And that's all that it is. And that one just kind of morphed for me. I didn't try to do it that way. But that's just what I found worked and helped him to slow himself down. So let's just go around our room. And Cindy, you were first, so you can go ahead. Okay, well... Um... Nick, I've taught a little bit differently than I have with other dogs. I taught him to go to mat, or mat is the cue I use. And that means get on your, get your butt on your bed now. Um, I'm tired of your antics, basically. Um, but what he goes right there and he stays there. And I've um, increased the duration by just reinforcing him periodically. And you'll see me throw food sometimes during these chats because 
there's when he's really struggling, I'll throw food at him more frequently. So I know he's going to be there and stay there. Now he's pretty much gotten the hint that if I'm doing video calls for any reason, he just goes and finds a place and lays down. He knows he's not necessarily part of it unless I call for it. Um, he's been taught down means down, middle means middle. And he just has learned that he, like when we go into an appointment, he just needs to chillax and, you know, stay laying down where I leave him, where I put him, regardless of what's going on with me. Um, with the exception of when I left the treat bag where he could get it, made the mistake of not holding it one time while I was getting acupuncture and he decided that he was going to get into the treat bag. That was not a good experience. <laughs> <laughs> not with tiny needles in me. <laughs> um, but for the most part, it's like, so I'm going to give an example of this. I've worked with him a lot. He, this is a dog that used to get car sick. Every single time we took him in the car when he was a puppy. And today we rode around on the para paratransit bus for over for a good hour. And during that time, he just tucked himself underneath my seat like he would if he was on an airplane and stuck his head down and was just like, whatever, and it chilled out. He didn't care what was going on. And people didn't even realize he was on the bus until I said something about him being on the bus. Um, but it's been a lot of just reinforcing being on his mat and reinforcing what, you know, reinforcing the behaviors I want, reinforcing being calm in the house. Awesome. So Sarah, you <laughs> popped in next. Do you want to answer on what cues do you use for any calming behaviors? So, and then what do those cues mean to you? Okay, I guess I tell George more a position I want him in if we're in like a specific situation. It's like I'll tell mm -hmm. him close for be between my feet, but facing forward or front for face me or under if I want him to go under something that's not right next to us. What if he's but a little too excited when you need him to do a more relaxed position? Do you have a cue that means bring it down a little bit? That dimmer switch, as Cindy called it? That's a good question. I guess usually if I'm doing something, he's calm. I guess if he, for some reason, was distracted or fidgety, I might tell him, chill, babe. <laughs> but that's like, about it. I know you do hunt test stuff. So if you if he were in hunt test mode and you needed him to focus on you more of like his service dog mode, Was is there a specific cue there that you use to help get him, you know, from the more excited hunting mode into work mode? That would be a type of dimmer switch. Oh, uh, not really. I guess he'll blow off hunting for sound alerts, but I, if I'm in that situation, I don't ask him to settle. So like if I was out hunting and he was being fidgety, I would tell him, you know, sit with an implied sit stay or down with an implied down stay. Gotcha. But if I'm just out and about, I don't tell him, you know, sit or down if we're out in public. He just chooses if he wants to sit or lie down. Nice. I know a lot of times that we start out with cues that we tend to phase out once the dogs learn the behavior. So, um, Emma, you were next. Yeah. Um, it's kind of funny. I have been teaching my dog words explicitly in English, like explicit cues, but I speak conversationally to him in Spanish. So anything that I, he knows in Spanish tends to mean that it happens um, somewhat accidentally, <laughs> but I would say that I started with explicit sit stays and down stays, and I first taught a go to bed um, in the very beginning, and that has been phased out a little bit to, in Spanish, like a rest, basically. Um, mm -hmm. 
and that works that I'm, I'm beginning PA training. So I've primarily used that in the house. And then back when I had a yard, uh, he knows that if we're playing and running around, I can get that cue until no to lay down and not chase or move and stay relaxed if I continue to run or train. Um, it will, and in PA I've given downstays which have worked relatively well. The one thing I'm struggling with a little bit and hope to take away from this is teaching a sit stay in situations where I'm not necessarily resting or I might be standing. Um, I found that he will sit and stay but he's excited about kind of being rewarded for sitting and staying rather than mm. being super relaxed and feel like he's a bit all or nothing where he wants to like he expects to really be resting and really be relaxed or to be kind of training and moving or focused um so yeah, that's that's about where i am and i haven't trained blanket yet but we penny and i we just discussed this and i'm going to begin implementing that that's a really good point with the sit versus the down as far as like our dogs naturally when they're relaxing lay down. And so yeah. when we reinforce that as a puppy, we don't necessarily think about it being the natural behavior that they would do when they're ready to relax, but they don't yeah. naturally sit for long durations of time. Dogs sit when we ask them to sit, they don't necessarily do it for a long duration of time. So if we think we're going to be in a position where we need that, that's something we definitely have to take those baby steps to increase the duration of that behavior. So. Yeah, he's he's okay when I'm paying or waiting in line. Um, but this week for the first time, I was spent 10 to 20 minutes standing up waiting for something. And I had to be able to like walk around as people came in or moved around me. So he couldn't be completely relaxed. And that was challenging for him. And I found it a little challenging to um, was he able make to, sure. Was he able to lay down during that at all? It, it was in a store where the, it was kind of under construction. It was like a very awkward layout. It was awkward for me to be standing up in it. So we were kind of out of the way, but kind of in the way. Um, mm -hmm. But it wasn't ideal. And there it are wasn't challenging ideal for places. Me. Yeah, yeah. And in, yeah. in situations, so the only time my dog absolutely has to sit is if I tell him to do it because we're practicing for a competition, or if I tell him to do it because we're actually in a competition. And the, okay. so like when I'm out and about doing service, doing with him with service dog stuff, I let him choose because there's times, you know, if they're on tile, it's much harder to sit than it is to down. It's much hard, it's much harder on their hips okay. over the life of the dog. And, you know, if they're trying to balance in a sit and their front feet keep sliding out, it's going to be real uncomfortable. Um, okay. Or you can train them to put their front paws on your on your feet, but it's still going to, you know, it, it to me it just doesn't it if it's not as natural. Let them, yeah, it's not natural, and if you can just let them choose it, because you're not in a position where you absolutely, you know, they don't absolutely have to be in that position for a specific reason. Um, okay. They can choose make the choice to sit to down based on how they're feeling. Mm -hmm. I've conditioned a standing weight too. So like in the bathroom, I don't necessarily want Azul to sit or down unless we're in a really clean bathroom and we're going to be there a really long time, but that's pretty rare. So I've conditioned that just stand and wait. Mm -hmm. And so we do that when we're in line in places as well. But you know, yeah. I mean, you can do it when whatever you want. You just are going to have to spend more time conditioning that if you need them to hold an extended six. That's just something we don't typically do. You know, so, they, you okay. have to use a lot of their core muscles to do it. Right. And I when, didn't realize sitting was so challenging. <laughs> one of the things you can do is um, some sort of raised platform. A lot of times if I go out, on a walk in the park, I'll find a like a um, we've got all kinds of raised 
um, a bench or a wall or and different things. And so I'll put pop Nick up on those and we'll go over positions on that. We'll do sits, downs, um, bows, um, stands. And the reason I do that up there is because it limits how far he can move and it puts him in a little bit different position. But if you have like a lower platform or a curb that you can put them on, um, you can walk around them, walk over them, do it, it in areas gives them where they're- a boundary to hold their position. Yeah, but boundary to hold them and to do it in an area where, you know, it's challenging for them. I, and we'll kind of go over that in blanket training a little bit more because we'll use the blanket as that same purpose. Yeah. Just going to say, I think one of the things that I've found that he struggled with, and maybe I was just asking for him to stay for too long at this point, um, was that I found that I was not finding the correct line of, um, I don't know if he was getting bored. He eventually, he was behaving really well and then he seemed to get a little bit bored. And then once he got bored, he seemed to get a little too excited and wanting to look at some of the other stuff going on in the store. So then I was trying to get his attention back, um, but then he was a little too excited by the stuff I was asking him to do. Mm -hmm. um, but that I realized it wasn't very, calm. very common when you first start PA stuff. <laughs> so okay. it's something you can build over time we can work <laughs> on it okay. so lulu you are next what cues do you use for teaching calm behaviors and then what do those cues mean to you um well i don't use verbal cues out in public it's all hand signals with izzy mm -hmm. um like if i have two fingers and i tap my leg that means she needs to stay closer and focus more on me versus focusing on everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And then if I have three fingers and I hold them like this, that means she needs to lay down behind me to block people from coming too close to me. Yeah, we're all mostly hand signals. <laughs> That's my bad. No, I use well, a lot of hand signals as well. They're still signals and cues. And dogs tend to understand hand signals before they understand verbal cues. Yeah, I was just, when I started training her when she was a puppy, I was worried that people would like look at me for telling her things in the store. So I was like, okay, we're going to teach you hand signals. So then they won't like really notice anything <laughs> and they won't stare at me. I have a weird fear of people staring at me. I'm weird. <laughs> nope. I do the same thing. That's why I phase out a lot of the verbal cues I use when I'm training a younger dog because I don't want, for one, I don't have to want to manage my service dog nonstop 24 seven when we're out and about. But for two, I want them to be able to predict the subtle body language I can give instead of needing to use that verbal cue. And it's kind of the same thing you're talking about there using hand signals and things that other people don't necessarily know, but it's still communication between you and your dog. Mm -hmm. And when you, when you are watching the advanced levels of obedience at obedience trials, it's all hand signals. It, That's it, awesome. <laughs> yeah. But you can tell the positive reinforcement trainers, the force free trainers from the traditional and, um, um what's what word am I looking for penny um balance trainers yeah, just, yep. because the pos the positive reinforcement force free trainers are going to be much quieter and much more subtle with their cue cues and the um balance, balance and traditional trainers are much harsher with they bark they literally bark their cues and bark their hand signals Oh, goodness. yeah so I don't want I don't ever want to be you know like barking at my dog in you know in the middle of a restaurant if I point to the floor and I want him to down I want him to down right now and he knows that and so he does so all right that brings Hi. us to Patty okay, if you want to answer the first question 
Our first question is, what calming behaviors do you teach? What cues do you use for any calming behaviors? And what does that cue mean to you? Because we all use those cues a little bit differently. With Rainy, I'm, I'm sitting in the dark, so I don't have a regular picture of it. You're fine. With, with Rainy in public, she, her chin rest is her go-to when we're sitting down. If people come over and try to talk to her and engage her or get her attention, all I have to do is ask for a chin rest quietly, and she puts her chin wherever and looks at me. Um, if we're walking around, up, I would probably use a hand target, but usually when we're walking, I don't, I don't have as much problem because I can walk away from people. With Jazer, who's eight months old, he's hardwired to sit from, from manding with his puppy culture breeder. So he, he automatically does a, a nice sit when he gets excited. But if people are trying to engage him or he seems to be getting a little excited, he knows the chin rest. He, he, we really have conditioned that relaxed down since he was eight weeks old. And he's got that down. I can just point at the ground and he hits it. If um, he's still a little excited, then I can ask for a chin rest with him. If we're up moving and I need to engage his mind or get him to move and he's excited, hand target is something that we've really gotten almost on a reflex level with him. I don't use a lot of hand, hand signals because if I have his leash, I can't use a hand signal because I can't use my right hand. So I use a very quiet voice like Cindy was talking about. And I totally agree with her that you can pretty much tell if somebody's barking commands at their dog that they're probably not force free. Although my husband's force free, but he was the chief of police. And sometimes I still have to remind him that he doesn't have to use, use such a clear thing with him. But we do a lot of just whispering to him on, on very quiet commands, cues when um, I'm talking to him. And then in public, I don't have to raise my voice. I can speak quietly my husband's exactly the same way he definitely gives louder cues and well, louder the, directions for sure all right so ashlyn would be next and she usually types her answers in the chat um so if she wants to answer we can kind of do that i do like that like Everybody had a different answer and which that was part of the reason I wanted that question because I've been doing a lot of training sessions recently where everybody says, how do you get your dog to lay down here? How do you get your dog to lay down there? You know, even just in the house, how do you get your dog to lay down when they really want to be barking out the window? You know, <laughs> so I've been answering these questions over and over and over again. And so having this recording is going to be a great way to be able to share with those people how everybody's a little bit different and some people use more verbal cues hand signals and some people just teach that down means stay there until I tell you something else to do kind of thing so that's kind of important also in the service dog world because I know we're all service dog handlers in here right now is that Almost everybody thinks there's one right way to do things. And a lot of times there isn't. A lot of handlers have different preferences. And so I'm always trying to stress that too. So thanks for your answers. I'm going to kind of go on to the next question and we can get Ashlyn's question in here for her answer if she types it in. So question number two tonight is how do you start out training those calm behaviors at home? Um, oh, so Ashlyn, the question, the first question was, what cues do you use for the calming behaviors and what do they mean to you? So like, do you use the cue settle, relax, a blanket or place cue? What cues do you use and how do you use them basically? Question number two is how do you train for the calm behaviors at home? So my go-to, my place that I start is I like to do this at mealtime. Um, like Patty had said, she's been conditioning it since her puppy was really little, which I do the same. Um, I taught Azul probably 
about nine weeks old how to get under my chair at the dinner table, even though we don't typically eat at the table. I just kind of wanted to start there. And so while I was eating my meal, I would lure him under, reward him for staying and toss a treat out so he could get out and so he could get lots of reps of practice. So I started with that, but then I quickly moved to my blanket mat training at mealtime. So almost all of my early settle time happens while I'm eating. Mm -hmm. So I'll be drip feeding my puppy kibble while I'm eating and slowly reduce that rate. That's like my go-to for teaching settle. <laughs> it really is. Now there's some other things I add along the way as my dog gets better at it. And obviously like if I'm one of the earlier places they're required to settle would be a doctor's office and I don't wanna be drip feeding there. So, but as long as I've done my groundwork at home and then I also usually do it at the park and some other places, even when we're out doing the early PA training in hardware stores and things, we'll do like a two or three minute practiced um, settle session with a mat that we travel with and get him used to doing it in public long before I ever approach that doctor's office with my puppy. So that's kind of my go-to is I'll do the mat at mealtime first. Um, Cindy? Okay, well, we ran into a big problem last year. I had moved and I had gone from a house to an apartment and I had the neighbors that nobody ever wants. They were loud, they were obnoxious, and I couldn't open my front door without somebody being out there smoking. So I had a lot of barking going on and I needed to curb the barking because I don't like barking. It drives me absolutely insane. So what we did was every time the barking started, I said, nice, and I threw a handful of kibble and Poe would go nuts over the kibble Nick would be kind of, mm, I don't know. And then he realized Poe was eating kibble. And so he would go get the kibble because Poe was eating. And so we did this and we still have a little bit of issue, but it's nothing where it was. And it's more like he gets excited and he's, but he's able to regulate, it installed a dimmer, dimmer switch in his barking level. And so it's created a calmness that's unbelievable and it has affected him because he's calm 90% of the time, even when he does get into one of those alert modes, he's much calmer, much quicker to come down and he'll start self-regulating much quicker. So, um, but as you progress, you go from saying nice and throwing the food as they're barking to letting them, you know, letting them come down off that a little bit before you say nice and throwing the food. And now we're to the point where we're working on, he barks, I say, I say quiet when he finishes barking and I give him the food. And it's getting close to being on cue. It's good. That's one um, kind of calming behavior we hadn't discussed yet was barking is and generally. Barking, it's self-reinforcing. And it's um, irritating to humans and dogs alike. You and know, one often dog barks, when they're barking, they're overexcited in some way, shape, or form. So way, the quiet cue is a calming cue. Mm -hmm. And it was actually really a big help this weekend when we were at the show because there were a couple, there were multiple dogs not that far from us that clearly the owner either didn't care that her dogs barked or had no clue that you could train your dogs not to bark. And because they were little dogs, you know, they could do anything because they're little dogs. And, um, you know, Nick, I was able to keep him much calmer than I would have a year ago. Yeah, I like that how calming behaviors can tend to, you know, once they're taught and generalized to a few situations, they tend to be able to expand rather quickly. So Ashlyn did answer the first question. She uses place on a mat. She also uses the chin rest or the head down. And then she will give the place cue anytime she needs Lily to lay down. 
in any particular place. She uses the place command. So i um, trying to remember my order here. Sarah, you were next. How do you start training for calm behaviors at home? Um, well, it didn't really go well when I first got George. I got him when he was eight months old and he was supposed to be a field trial dog but wasn't high drive enough for it. So he came to me and had plenty of drive for everything I could ever want to do. But um, I guess his breed, working cockers, are not known for being calm and settling. Like people will complain that there's bounce off the walls at 10 years old. So I knew I needed to work on it. But I kind of struggled because food would get him so amped up and toys would get him even more amped up as rewards that he could lie down on his side and, you know, cock his hip and put his head on the ground, but he would never actually be calm if he was waiting for food. So I started over and I would just have him sit kind of in between my legs while I sat on the floor and just pet him <laughs> really calmly and slowly and talk to him. And I kind of conditioned it that way to get him to actually relax. That's a very important one. Sometimes if you're using food as the reinforcer, food is so energizing that it can be hard to teach calm if your dog is super food motivated. Oh, Emma, you were next. Is for how do you train calm behaviors at home? Yeah. Um, how did you get started? I I don't know if this answers the question, but I, I think I, I would say that I, again, first got started by teaching a go-to-bed cue. Mm -hmm. And uh, at first that literally meant go to bed <laughs> in his bed. Um, so I would use that if he was a little overexcited and needed to rest or when I was eating I would ask him to go to bed um, and think in in general um, when I was working or needed him to be calm and quiet I would just make my movements really boring and he seemed to pick up on it pretty well um that's a very good point you know they tend to match our energy yeah. so if we're extra excited doing something it can be hard to get them to be calm but in the early days when we're training if we can model the calmness they will much more quickly also become calm i i would oh, I, I would say the hardest part about getting him calm at home was a mixture of also when I lived in an apartment and had people above and to the sides of me making crazy noises and having um, probably some genuinely dangerous people <laughs> walking by that were very loud. Uh, and when that happened, I, it, it typically worked pretty well for me to, again, like model the calm behavior and ask him, I, I would spend like 10 to 20 seconds asking for really basic tricks and then telling him to go to bed. And then he luckily picked up on that pretty quickly that I didn't care. Um, and then outside in the yard, uh, when physically training, he really wanted to chase, especially since we played chase as a game. Um, so at first I asked for a down stay and then I had to kind of work up to moving a little bit erratically and then progressively, erratically, and for longer amounts of time. And I think eventually he picked up, like, oh, okay, this is just, like, boring time. Nice. I, I would literally tell him it's boring. I'm going to be boring. One thing I like is that you sent him to bed. I did. And the, uh, the reason, one of the reasons I like that is um, dogs need a lot more rest than we realize. And yeah. puppies... To, and I, one thing I noticed with Nick that I hadn't noticed with other puppies I've had was Nick would wind him, you know, some kids will wind themselves up when they, they get too excited to sleep. And when you put them to bed or in their crate, 
they just, you know, especially if you put them in with a calming cue um, for active rest, then they get, they relax more and they fall asleep quicker. Just like if you put yeah. your kid to bed with their favorite blanket and their yeah. stuffed animal. My, my dog is feel much better putting himself to bed or like he, even not literally going to his bed all the time anymore. But especially in the beginning, um, it was kind of funny because I would tell him to go to bed or I would tell him to drink water or I would tell him to rest and he'd be like kind of huffy about it. And then the second he was in position, he would like fall asleep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> They're just like kids. Uh-huh. Yeah. Slide in as long as they can. An overtired tantrum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a good point. And that kind of brings us to question three. So I'm going to oh, stop you there and we'll talk through, about though. it more. <laughs> so Lulu? Um, I didn't really teach Izzy anything to be calm at home. She kind of just copied my older dog that I had at the time and my cat. Nice. If they were like tired, she'd just go lay with them and fall asleep. And she didn't really do anything. If my beagle um, wanted to play, they would both go to the door because my beagle just, whenever she wanted to play, we'd go outside. And Izzy just kind of copied her and outside was playtime, inside was Calm just time. bed. <laughs> nice. I love when older dogs help teach the house rules like that not you know not that they're really trying to teach the dog but the dogs the younger dogs can just follow along and figure it out <laughs> it makes it a lot easier <laughs> uh -huh. I use my older dogs for stuff like that all the time I had to give Poe a lot of break because Nick is so active and so drivey and Poe is not <laughs> right I mean, she let me bump her with a lawnmower. So that's the kind I'm going from one end to the other end of the spectrum. So teach her teaching the house rules. Well, it's a really good idea for a lot of dogs. It doesn't always work. Right. Because some dogs take the subtle messages easier and some not, mm -hmm. so, not quite so subtly at first. All right, Patty, I believe you would be next. How do you start okay. training the calm? With... Geyser, we started that from the day he got here. With He settles under my feet. We did it with the other dogs when we're eating. The only place you get to eat is laying down by my feet. And he would see Rainy automatically settles. And she gets some, we keep kibble at the kitchen table to reinforce settles. So he would just lay down and get his kibble. And we do it all the meals every time we're at the kitchen island it that's just where they get food they had to lay down by my feet if they expect to have pieces of kibble there's also a mat in the kitchen that they settle on and that rainy likes to settle on and jazer likes to lay by her so like the other lady said we've got they learn a lot from the other dogs and if you've got high energy out of control dogs in your house all the time young dogs are going to pick that up Fortunately, my young dog has Rainy, who's well-trained to pick things up from. His settle is so good from doing it since he was little. Plus, I did the same thing on the scooter. I put him on the floorboard of my scooter as a little puppy, and he'd get treats for settling and being calm there. When we're today on the pier, River was over here, the other golden. He's running around, even going nuts, trying to get Jason to play with him, but I'm on my scooter, so Jaser comes over and just lays across my scooter and automatically settles. I don't have to tell him to. He That's the place he's learned he gets reinforcement. And the kind of behavior that gets reinforced is that calm behavior. So it's been like hours and hours every day of doing this. We went to the ball game tonight. He automatically came over next to my chair and just laid down. That That's where he gets to get reinforced for things. Um, the barking that someone mentioned, that has been, that's a challenge with especially adolescents and puppies when they're learning from older dogs. And Rainy does like to go out in the backyard, bark at the moon. And we've let her do that. I don't care, I live in a real place. But when I got him, 
I don't want him starting to do that. So what we do, and also the dogs that run the fence next door when we're outside, they bark. I saw a video, I, I don't remember, I think it was Donna Hill that posted it about using the dark barking dogs to predict a treat. So when Rainy barks outside and I've got him settling inside, she barks, I follow up with the treat. When the dogs run the fence and they bark, I follow that with a treat as long as he's over here by me. So we're eight months old now. So when dogs bark, he looks at me like, where's my treat? And that's much better than barking. I did the same thing with Azul. And I, you brought up a point, kind of makes me wonder if anybody's researched that. But if I had to guess, like, the vast majority of my clients that struggle with teaching their dog how to be calm have only one dog in the home, and that's the one they're struggling with. The people that have an older dog in the home that already know how to be calm and lay down and relax because they don't have all that puppy energy tend to teach the younger dogs. So the younger dogs learn much earlier. Now, I did have um, not my current service dog, but my last service dog definitely had more energy and needed more work in the learning to settle. But she was also the first puppy that we had in the house in quite some time. So like my older dog, Cam, that helped teach Azul how to settle, that was the first puppy ever since we had rescued him. So he hadn't been through that early puppy stage yet with her. So it just added more excitement and took a little bit longer. But yeah, I think that's a valid point. I'm going to have to look and see if I if anyone has actually done research in that, in that when they're the only dog in the home at a younger age, they struggle more with nap time or relax time. Well, I wonder too if it's the experience level of the owners, because if you've only had ever had one dog and you're struggling with how to manage one dog versus if you've had dogs all your life and you're not struggling with it. Like I, I kept Nick and Poe separate a lot because Poe just didn't want to put up with him. And I didn't want her to turn around and, you know, resent him, resent him. Or, you know, she would have been very polite at first, but he wasn't very polite. Right. So, you know, but I didn't, but I also felt it wasn't a hundred percent her job to raise Nick. Right. And it's not. No. And so, but I knew what to do to stop the barking because I have a great Pyrenees that does not bark. She barely lets me know anybody's at the door. Um, so I knew how to stop it. It was just, or significantly decrease it. She like alerts me. I need to go out. I need to come in, you know, that kind of thing. But I wonder if the people that actually really struggle are people that with one dog that have never had a dog before, as opposed to see, you know, just, they only have one dog at the moment. Right. That's a good that's point. A good... Inexperience does tend to make them not realize how much that puppy needs to rest. Go ahead, Patty. You had something. Well, I was to just going to say that that's a really good point. And it's, it's also makes a difference. If you have experience, and that older dog is relaxing. Yes, mm -hmm. you've, you've got the experience, the older dog's doing it, but if you don't know what you're doing, you have an older dog that's bouncing off the walls and not doing the way you want to. Yep. So experience goes both ways. An inexperienced person is more likely to have another dog in the home that's a really bad example for the, for the, the puppy that comes in and picks up those behaviors. And another thing in the home that makes a huge difference is children. If yeah. we're retired, I have a very nice laid back home, but people, when the kids come over or something, they ramp up, they ramp Jazer up and I have to really use a lot of care to keep them where they're not, they're not exciting him. But imagine if you live with some of you may live with little kids, they're, they're not going to be calm all the time. Yeah, not 24 seven. It can't I happen. <laughs> I, I, I've done that puppies with toddlers and a it's a lot of work I don't recommend it I would not recommend it to anybody and b you as you're dealing with 
young age dog and a young age person and the young age person doesn't understand no you can't you know you can't ride the great dane or you can't ride the newfoundland um and you have to be really on top of things on how you manage it and i i don't think enough people step up and go oh i really need to manage the situation i had a baby gate up partially to keep when um for nick when he was a puppy partially to keep Nick out of one area of the, the house. And the other reason was to keep, give Poe a place to go inside in the air conditioning where she could lay down on the floor and not be bothered. Right. And if she would come to the gate when she wanted something, she'd come to the gate, she'd let me know. She'd just look at me and like, come on, I need some attention. And, um, you know, it, it, she let me know. She had her way of communicating. We do the same thing with Cam and a new puppy because he he does really well with puppies, but he also is, you know, more prone to if he's getting annoyed because the puppy's invading his space too much, then he's going to be more likely to do a growl or something that I want to prevent. So we use a baby gate to give him his safe space. Um, Ashlyn also answered the questions. So she uses the cue of pointing to the mat to tell her dog or Lily to go to the mat and she taught that with a luring at first luring the dog to the mat where she wanted her to go and she said for barking I used the look at that game right and I yeah. I've expanded how I perceive that game because it's not always just a look at that it's more like what's that because it could be something they see smell hear it could a uh, it could be any feel. It could be anything. Yeah, it starts with a look at that, but then it becomes a process that. Mm -hmm. Figure out that that doesn't mean anything you have to react to. Yeah, and like I have stairs above my bedroom that come down that are on the outside. And when the, the people go up and down them, like in the middle of the night, I swear. And I have Nick in my room with me and... So he used to bark at the stairs every single time. And it, it's taken a lot of work of doing the look at, basically the look at that game on the stairwell to get him to just calm down. Oh, that's not my problem. Right. That, but my barking it, that what is that with an adolescent is, and barking is very important. Gates mm -hmm. are important. We have big windows that reflect stuff. So at night, I'll hear Jays are barking, so I want to come. I come in and see why is he barking, and it, and I usually can figure out he sees something in the wind or he sees his reflection. So what I have to do is use the mini gates we have all over the house, and I just block him. I turn the lights where it doesn't reflect, and then I put up a gate where he doesn't get to go in there and look at whatever is causing him to wonder what's that and get excited. So gates are very important, even in retired houses like us with no kids. <laughs> it and, keeps, right. it, 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 and it will get them away from the window. I have that big window they love to look at. If somebody's barking at night, you don't get to sit in front of the window. You're going to come behind the gate that keeps you out of the window. It gives you a lot of room, but you don't get to go sit in front of the window if you're going to sit there and bark at stuff. Right. Blinds can do the same thing if you have... I don't um, have any. I have too big a window, so I have yeah. to use plates. No, but, but I mean, blinds but, are very important. But blind yeah, anything to put distance or something in between, either yeah, visual, blocker, visual blockades of some sort. I've got um, actually this press on um, stuff that cheating that goes on my uh, frosting that goes on my window that I have covering one pane on my window that you can't see specifics out. You can see kind of hazy stuff in color and it's significantly reduced the squirrel barking. Yeah. And that way I can have my window, my blinds up. Well, the bigger windows you have, the harder it is. We have yes. this lake behind our house. So we've got like two huge windows and two glass sliding doors right where I'm sitting that overlooks the lake and the squirrels. And then in the front, there's a giant living room window that you can watch the neighborhood. So those are places that 
you got to block, use the gate when you're not in there. Or are they just a young adolescent's going to just start barking at everything? Oh, yeah. Right. So our last and final question, because I don't want this to go too late tonight, is about relaxation protocols or routines that you use to develop calmness. And I use the word protocol hesitantly because I know there's a very popular trainer out there that has a big, long, and not that it's not a good protocol, it's awesome, but you know, it works through a sit, a down, a stay, and slowly building time and everything, but it's like step by step, do this routine exactly in this order which is kind of what I mean, but not necessarily that particular one. So say you go outside for a walk. That's a good one because I like to tell people to start there. It's easy to explain. So you just went outside and played a game or went for a walk or went fishing or, you know, whatever it was that you did that got your dog a little bit more energized. And now you're coming back into the house. So how, what do you do to help teach them that all right now that you're coming back in we need to slow back down and calm back down and I can start with my basic example that I'll use with a young puppy is that I kind of set up even when we just come in from a potty outing I use the same routine if I have time before I go out I'll do something very minor before I go out to prepare it can be something as simple as make sure that I have the treat container sitting right by where I'm going to sit down when I come in the house. So we come in, I take the leash off, I will completely disengage from my dogs for a period of time. And that might only be like five seconds in the beginning. You know, it might be when I take my shoes off, might be when I take my shoes and coat off. You know, it might be when I take my shoes, coat off, and then go use the bathroom as I'm slowly adding in that disengagement time to make it longer. And then I'll re-engage in whatever that calming activity I want to do next is. So it could be some treats or kibble. It could be giving them a massage. It could be we're going to turn on some light music and just chill or I've even used like my yoga mat and doing stretches on the floor because then they want to be with me and I can give them kibble while I'm doing something calm. And so that's kind of my routine. Anytime we come in the doors with a younger puppy and then when they learn how to calm themselves in the house that inside is a calmer place, I will go ahead and change that up and not necessarily follow it. But I follow those same steps even though they might vary slightly every single time we come in the door with a young puppy so that they can learn that transition. Um, Cindy, do you do any kind of routine like that to help go from your higher play to a more yeah, calm? We have to kind of go out a ways to um, get to anything that we're gonna do. So we have to go down a walkway. And so that's kind of our, but we have a little problem because the cats like to hang out on the walk around this area. And he really thinks, uh, I think he, he's the reincarnation of Alf, if anybody remembers Alf. <laughs> um, and so it's been a challenge, but he's gotten much better at it. We've done a lot of game, pl game playing and w working on loose leash walking out there, trying to get his excitement under control. But I do a lot of um, figure eights and um, kind of loose leash type games for him as we're at, if we're having issues. If he's just being calm, like this afternoon, he was just being calm. He was in work mode. He had his harness on and he had his gentle leader on because we had gone to Kaiser. And so we just walked in. Um, sometimes I will... I will unlock the door and if I need to, sometimes I will undo his harness and gentle leader before I open the door. But most often I just undo the harness and the gentle leader, let him loose. And I take care of whatever stuff I need to take care of, hang the keys up so I don't lose the keys. Cause if I don't put the keys where they belong, I'm gonna lose the keys. <laughs> and put the, le push the leash and the harness away because if I don't put them away, I'm going to lose them. 
And so since I know this, he just kind of just goes, okay, well, I know the routine now. I know I'm not going to get a lot of attention. But the other thing that I do, because we all have this issue potentially with service dogs, is Nick's really cool about being in his crate. I actually stuck him in a crate that's like half the size of what his small crate is like this weekend just to see if he'd fit. And he did it. Um, but so the other thing that I do is if I have him stuffed in the crate for some reason, like I've gone someplace and I didn't take him, I took a service human, or if I've um, gone to take some trash out and I didn't, wasn't able to take him because I couldn't carry all of it, I might stuff him in his crate. And then when I come back, I may not open the crate right away. I might go and do two or three things before I let him, I might start a couple things. I might sit down and watch a little TV and then I'll let him out of the crate. And so I want him to not necessarily, I want him to understand, yeah, that you're going to settle down when you come in, but you're not going to get all hyped up when I come in, if I don't have you with me. Right. And that's a very good comment. A lot words. of choose. So he has, he has rest time where he's not doing anything. He has rest time where he has choose, um, different types of choose throughout the day. And then he has play time. All right, Sarah, um, do you use any kind of routine to help develop calmness? I guess kind of a carryover from when I was first teaching it that I was thinking about is I used to, you know, put them all over really slowly and use that to get him to actually become calm when he was lying down. So it, if I'm encouraging him to be calm, I'll kind of put him under his chin a little bit and maybe like take a deep breath and go, <sighs> and then usually calm after that. Nice. I like massage or, you know, that gentle, slow, calming petting, even if it's not an official massage to help bring calm down. I do that a lot for puppies at yeah. nap time. So... I'm trying to remember who was next. Emma. Um, uh, I'm not fully sure how to answer this question, but I would say there are two main times he needs help calming down. One is when he's overexcited or overtired. Um, and I taught a, or overheated, just basically he's physically needs to rest. Um, and I taught a go drink water cue. <laughs> Basically, he just needs to mind drinking water is what I taught. Um, mm -hmm. but 90% of the time when I ask, he'll kind of mime it and then go back and drink like one to two bowls straight of water. And then he'll like realize that he's tired. <laughs> um, so that's really helped. And I've typically asked for that. Um, he plays rough with my partner. It's the only one he plays rough with. He's literally a wrestler and they wrestle. Um, and there are times where he like gets a little overexcited or overtired. Um, and if I don't interrupt it, he's getting, he's getting better at regulating himself. But if I don't interrupt it, sometimes he'll like get pseudo stressed. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll have him like relax and typically he'll rest and then they either stop playing or five or 10 minutes later, he's excited to play again. And then, um, or if he's playing with other dogs or it's just like a really hot day out, sometimes he gets overtired or the other dog gets overtired. Um, and then he's generally just very good at mirroring my energy and picking up on like a look or my facial, mm -hmm. my body language and my tone of voice. Um, the other main time is again, when I'm really excited or um, uh, like at, at the very beginning, um, he had to be able to remain calm when I did a handstand against the wall or practice sleeps inside. <laughs> In gymnastics which is like very exciting for a dog I think okay. or it was exciting for him for sure uh, which was dangerous for him and me and just not 
ideal. Um, and for that, I, I use the kind of the go to bed, rest, boring. And then I also combined it with um, going very like slower into those motions to teach him that he doesn't need to react. And if he reacted or got excited, I would become super boring and kind of disengage or walk away and then come back and he, gotcha. he learned over time. Now he doesn't react. That's also another really good point that we didn't talk about. I mean, obviously it's good for training wise to model calmness, but there may be certain times where we can't be calm with what we're doing and we need yeah. our dog to settle and be calm anyways. You know, whether that's running on a treadmill or whether you play basketball or, you know, whatever it is, there may be times when we need our dog to be calm. For Azul, a big one in that aspect is if I'm working with another dog training client, I might need to put him in a downstay or I might hand his leash off to the actual other person that I'm working with so that I can take their dog and demonstrate something. And I will need him to remain calm in that aspect, even though I might be amping up the other dog, he still needs to remain calm. So that's something kind of similar that we haven't discussed yet, but that's important to build into as well. Um, yeah. Lulu, do you have any kind of routine that you do when you're trying to encourage calm and quiet? Um, well, when we go outside, we usually walk to the dollar store and back, and then when we come back inside, she just goes and chews on her antler, <laughs> and that's about it. Unless my cat gets her going, then they play, and then Izzy will be like, she'll pick up her toy and throw it at the cat, and then Izzy will just go lay down, because she, if she doesn't want to play with my cat, she just throws her toy at my cat and then goes lays down. She's weird. <laughs> yep, no, I totally get that, and chews are a great way to help bring a dog down that's overexcited. So, and it's, it's also something that they need to do mm -hmm. on a regular basis. That Chewing and licking gets rid of the stress, so it helps bring them down naturally. Yeah, so if you can't do chews for whatever reason, licking mats with whatever they like to lick are another really good option, especially if you can like stick it in the freezer and make it so it'll last longer. And you snuffle just... feeding of some sort, snuffle mm -hmm. mats, snuffle boxes, feeding in the grass, that kind of thing. Getting a box and filling it with a bunch of odds and ends, maybe the recycle that hasn't gone out yet and putting some dog food in there and letting them dig through there. I'm going to go out of order just a minute so I can read Ashlyn's answer before I forget about it because that's where my brain is tonight. So she doesn't do a lot with a routine because she just, because of her mobility issues, she's very calm in general and most dogs pick up on that. But she shared an example because she was working with one of her uncle's German shepherds on self-control and with a lay down. So she would have the dog get onto the couch and the dog would get onto the couch, start doing a circle slow pet. So she was doing massage basically and then long body pets. So circle pets and then long body pets to kind of increase encourage that calming presence um so patty do you have a routine that you use to go from a higher energy thing into a more calm state i think routine itself has a lot to do with expecting what to expect next we go every day we spend a couple of hours off leash outside before we go we take a walk do we get rivers comes over here our, our dogs run loose play in the lake. Then when we get, sun starts going down and we come in, it's time to have supper. And my husband cooks supper for them. He, Randy's on the renal diet. He does um, stir fry veggies for her and it takes a while. When JJ was a lot younger, he would want to stand, sit over there and bark at him because he wanted his food. That was the time I had to work on teaching him how to be calm while Bart was cooking and getting his food ready. And I did a lot of things. Um, during that period, but where we are now, 
it's it's the routine of Bart walks over to the stove to cook. We've been outside and there's a mat over here behind me in the floor and that's where Rainy waits and he goes lays by her. So it's it's mostly just the routine and the signal we're coming inside. And then I sit here where I'm sitting at the island right now. If I'm sitting here, that's kind of a cue that things are calm now. And if you want, you know, if you want food, you're going to have to sit on the mat or you're going to have to lay down by my feet. That's that's what we reinforce is being calm in those positions in the kitchen. So we don't have to give them a cue or put them in a pen or a crate or anything. They just have learned right. to get reinforced. Right. I need to lay here or there and be calm. If I step out on the patio, if it's still sunlight out and nice day, I sit on a table out there and it's the same thing. Me sitting down is a cue that, you know, we're done today, supper's getting ready. And if you want some kibble while you're waiting the place to to get it is lying calmly at my feet but they still have the choice if they want to to go outside and run around outdoors but that's what they choose because that's what's been reinforced and that's what's coming is supper yep we've actually kind of changed our routine now that we don't have a puppy in the house (laughs) so that started because it's my husband's routine with my last service dog that spent a lot more time off leash outside whenever we gave her the indoor cue we would follow that up with a treat when she got to the door well then we followed it up with moving that treat slowly further inside the house and it became well my husband's sitting in his chair right by the treat box so I would open the door to let him in and tell him to go get daddy And so now it's more, my husband is trained to do that. So anytime I have the dogs outside now, they actually get more amped up by coming in because they all run to daddy, even if it's just for a pet, but they usually get a cookie talked out of them as well. (laughs) But so we, now that they know how to settle, they actually, we don't worry about settling when we come in. They can get excited and run to him as long as... Mm -hmm they settle when they're done. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think a big key on having calm behavior that you can reinforce is you've got to meet their doggy needs. And with adolescents, especially you have to meet their movement needs. And if you're not doing that, you're, you're wasting your time working on trying to get a, an adolescent dog to settle. They, they just can't. Totally agree. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yep, that that's a real struggle as well. And if you don't, if you have a new dog, because you brought in a dog that's already an adolescent, not knowing what their energy and exercise needs are and their mental energy needs are, trying to figure that out can be an extremely stressful time as you're trying to fill their needs and also reinforce settle once you've actually taking care of their needs and finding that balance is extremely well, that's, challenging. <laughs> that's where your stuffle mats, your licky mats and your chewies really come in. If you're trying to figure out exactly where their high energy levels are because, and food puzzles, because if they're spending mental energy on that and mental energy on training, it's also burns up a certain level of, energy that they're not going to need it's going to change their movement energy and And I think that's really important for people who are stuck indoors in in apartments where most people don't have a life like I do they have to deal with a lot of indoor time and those kind of things that Cindy's saying are so important I do a similar thing but it's much easier I'm outside and throw a I throw a handful of kibble in the leaves and have the same type of a neck. Yeah, you've got a you've got a snuffle mat. mat right there. Mm-hmm. Or well, on the driveway. The, right. One of the things I do is I have a cat toy that's got a um I don't know, it's a fuzzy thing on it about yay long. And Nick loves it. And it, it's on a, a um fiberglass pole that is flexible and it, you know it's it's like a whip or um what's the proper flirt name pole. Flirt it's pole. like a flirt pole but it's for a cat so we play flirt pole in the house with that 
on a regular basis because that's one of Nick's favorites, fa most favorite toys. The other thing is I have um, three sets of, uh, uh, or three pairs of um, chasers of, with varying length handles on them. And some of them we use in the house, some of them we use outside. What's and, a chaser? Pardon me? What's a chaser? It's like a fuzzy. Um, Similar to a flirt pole, but well, take away I the pole. Let me grab one. <laughs> Let me grab it's the one same up. kind of idea. It's something they can run around and grab so you, and you can move well, you it because it's it a it longer, the bigger toy. Yeah, typically, I mean, and if you have a taller, bigger dog, you can have it in the air, too. Well, it's so just a matter of you can move it a little bit faster. So this is the bite part, and then it's got a handle. Oh, somebody's coming over to see it. You so you call that a chaser? That's a yeah. chaser. And some of them will have... Um, like elastic right in here and um, so that it gives when they pull. What's the so difference in that and a tug toy? It's, it's just got toy. the longer handle on it. It's got a handle on it. It's just a little bit different version of it rather than a rope or I don't know if you can you can't see it but Nick just came over and he's staring at his chaser. Oh, I but wonder if Nick chaser would like that. Yeah. They come in, like this one is wool. You can get them in wool. I've got two in rabbit and uh, the other two I have are in black wool. You got rabbit? You, those come in rabbit? You can get them in rabbit. That's what I, I would need. like to get one in rabbit. Yeah. Somebody yeah. will find blue that. nine. Are you, you finding the rabbit ones off of Amazon? The rabbit chasers on Amazon? I think so, but they have a very, very short handle. The other thing that's really good to have is any kind of flirt pole. Wait, that's not yours to take. Um, any kind of flirt pole, especially if you live in an apartment, because you can usually find some place you can take it and play with the flirt pole outside. And I was lucky enough to get, have my sister give me a lot, brand new lunch whip that she had in her stash that I could attach a toy to, to make my, um, chase my thing, my, um, whatever you call them. I always end up calling them whips because that's what I've always heard them called. And then it's basically a horse whip, but it's a long yeah. pole with a rope on it. So you can get the toy further away from your body. Yeah. Izzy has a flirt pole. Yeah. Like that. And then uh, got it off Amazon. <laughs> The, small the longer one, but it the, the longer the um, loose pieces, the better. The further you can get away from you, you know, the more f games and chases you can do with it. Mm -hmm. I teach a lot of my clients how to use that because, especially where I'm at, we don't have a lot of fenced-in areas where we can play. So typically the dog that is chasing it is also on a long line clipped to the back of a harness. So there's kind of a skill in learning how to do that safely for everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it's easy to get the long line twisted around your ankle or get the mm -hmm. line on the flirt pole twisted. Mm -hmm. And so I teach a lot of clients how to do that <laughs> safely. <laughs> Today I took one of the little ones that one that's on a very short loop that's got rabbit and I to my appointment and while I was waiting for my bus to pick me up on the way home we were working on some obedience because there were some things that Nick did this weekend that I didn't like and want to fix and so we were working on those things and then I was using the chaser for a reward so it's really nice to have, you know, something small like that, that you can either stick in a pocket or tie to a belt loop or something that you can reward the dog with. And then when he, and then he's it's like, oh, I'm done. He got home and he's been real quiet until just now when I got that chaser out. Now he's doing something to it. He's ready to go again. He's well, trying we, to chew it. We did answer all our questions and this has gone on for over an hour, about an hour and 15 minutes. So I want to kind of wrap it up. If anybody has anything else they want to add real quickly about calming behaviors, I want to allow that. So does anybody have anything they want to add to the discussion tonight? Well, the one thing I would say is if your dog, 
especially adolescents, if they tend to be um, I don't, reactive and more, you know, get into that area where you don't want them to be because they just can't control themselves. More overly excited or over overly threshold. excited and possibly too aggressive. If you get, if you keep them in the calm, relaxed area, they have to go up to the excited area and over to the, I don't, I don't feel over good. threshold, like, over, over threshold area before they, before they become a problem. Whereas if you keep them amped up a little bit and you, like some people like to do, um, they will get, it's only one jump to being overexcited. And right. if you can keep them calm and relaxed at home, they're much more calm and relaxed when you take them out. I can tell when Nick is over threshold just by how he's, or when he's going to be questionable just by how he's behaving at home. And if he looks like he's having a bad day, I'm not going to take him. I'm going to let him stay home and chew, his, chew while I go out. I, that is a very valid point that you need to be able to read your dog. And so if you do have that new adolescent in the home, that can be a very, very challenging to know whether it's a good day to do a training that's a little bit harder for them or whether you need to be more slow minded on that particular day. Either change your training plans or, you know, change it to another day or, um, change what you're going to do that day make it a little bit easier on the days you know they're struggling mm -hmm. yeah all right let's go ahead and wrap it up there I do want to thank you all for being here I am going to open up a poll on the working pause page I know we did it a while ago but that way if you have any other things that you want to see in the trainer talk discussions you can go ahead and add them to that poll once I open it and we can continue having the great discussions. I think, you know, these discussions are kind of twofold. I know that I learn from hearing everyone else talk about it, but we can also share these out to help people that are struggling with it. They all get recorded. They all go on YouTube and the link all gets posted in the Working Pause page. So if two to three weeks from now you're working with somebody that is having an issue with calmness you can say you know here's this is what i do but here's some things that other people do watch this video so feel free to use any of the trainer talks in that way or even just review it yourself if you're having that day where you're struggling with it and need you know that little bit of reminder oh what did that one person say so if you ever need those links just let me know but other than that, I hope everyone has a good night and thank you for participating tonight. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, you. Penny. Good night. Good night. Good night.